She wrote it in the 41st year of her life. She died at age 42. Her name was Frances Ridley Habergau. She wrote the song that we just sang. She was born to an Anglican clergyman. She also wrote some other songs that may be very familiar to you. She wrote the song, Take My Life and Let It Be. And then she wrote one of my very favorite songs of all, Is It For Me, Dear Savior. She wrote uh, over 50 different hymns, Francis Ridley Habergau. Now, of course, what she wrote is only true if it matches up with the Word of God. And just as we were noting in the last hour with reference to attribution, sometimes someone may quote a statement that was made by someone who's not a member of the church. And I've seen brethren really get bent out of shape about ever doing that. Now, I think you can overdo that. But I've seen some brethren get up a bent out of shape about ever doing that. And those same brethren every Sunday sing songs throughout the entire worship service that were written primarily by those who are not members of the church. And it's not consistent. If you're going to be consistent, you're going to have to throw out everything that wasn't written by the brethren, including the Psalms, if you're going to go that far with it. What matters is, does it match up with what the Word of God says? That's the final litmus test. And Francis Havergal did write a statement in that song that I sang as a boy, along with all the other people in church, and I had no idea what it meant at that young age. Peel out the watchword. The only thing I knew about peeling out when I was a teenager was something I wasn't supposed to do in the car, right? And the word peel here, in this case, you might notice it's spelled P-E-A-L, not P-E-E-L, like peeling potatoes or peeling an orange. Uh, no, this is peel. And if you look it up, it has to do with making a loud sound, making a, a loud noise to signify something, to send forth a message. And so to peel a bell, to, to make a loud sound with the bell, to make a loud sound with an alarm, so peel, make a loud noise. Peel out the watchword. What's a watchword? You look it up, it's sometimes used as a password between sentry guards who are exchanging shifts. Sometimes you'll see the word watchword used to describe a battle cry. And that's the concept here. You'll note the song we just sang has a very military flavor to it, which matches up with 1 Timothy 6, 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Now, regardless of what your political views are, and I'm not here to even entertain those right now, I think none of us will ever forget, just from an historic standpoint, a former president of the United States having a bullet fired at him and then being able to compose himself enough to stand up and to look at the crowd and to say, fight, fight, fight. Now, when it comes to Christianity, some might think it never... Can those two things go in the, excuse me, go in the same sentence? And yet, Paul told Timothy to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. And as I read the prophets in particular, I see them peeling out the watchword on a regular basis. In fact, this sermon isn't really hard to Outline definitions, that's, that's what we just did. We talked about the definition of peel, the definition of watchword. Sound forth the alarm, sound forth the cry. May I remind you in Numbers chapter 10, there's explicit instruction given regarding the sound of the trumpet and whether it meant it's time for a, an assembly, it's time for war, Numbers 10, 9 and following. And so sometimes a loud cry would be pealed and the people would know, ah, we know what that sound means. It means the fight is on and that we have to rally around God and his people. And so as you look through the prophets with me, now I want to get to the second part of this message. We looked at definitions, now demonstrations. You're going to see with me some individuals who peeled out the watchword. They made a loud sound 
with God's word being the watchword that they were giving to others and they weren't going to back away from the battle. You and I live at a time when we're going to have to be courageous, loving but courageous about what's right and what's wrong. Would you direct your attention to Isaiah chapter 58 for just a moment, please? Isaiah chapter 58, the very first sentence in verse one is peel out the watchword. Look at it, look at it, cry aloud, make a loud noise. Say this loud and clear, make sure everyone hears this. And he says, spare not, don't hold back. Don't have pity on others and say, well, I'm not going to, to tell them this because they probably don't want to hear it. No, cry aloud, spare not, and then here you go. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Isaiah says, make a loud noise that sends forth the message of God to the people about their transgressions and sins. One of the best individuals in all of history who peeled out the watchword God wanted peeled or sounded forth was Jeremiah. And if you'll go to Jeremiah chapter one, I just wanna take a quick journey through the book of Jeremiah with you as we head toward Ezekiel. And I want you to see the kind of courage these men had to sound forth their voice and to cry out and to send the watchword out that God wanted made known. When God called Jeremiah to be a prophet, he told him in verse five of chapter one, that before he'd even formed him in the belly, he knew of him, knew him, and had ordained him to be a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah says, Lord, I can't speak. I'm but a child, I'm too young, I can't do it. God tells him in verse seven, say not, I am a child. Thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces. Will you please file that away? You're going to see that become a regular expression. Be not afraid of their faces. When I was in college, a roommate of mine had a book that had 100 real life situations that had happened to people in churches of Christ as gospel preachers. And one of them, we used to ask each other uh, late at night, hey, what if number 56 happened to you? What would you do? And there were like 100 real life things, one of which was this. While you were preaching, a member sticks out her tongue at you. And I've never had that happen to my knowledge. Maybe it happened, I just didn't see it. Uh, an elder in the Lord's Church in South Haven, his wife used to tell me before I finished and preached my last sermon there, she said, before you preach your last sermon here, I will stick my tongue out at you, be aware. She was teasing, she knew that I had mentioned this before. Look, I, I do not know, I do not know what it's like to have people stick their tongues out at me while I'm preaching, but I do know I've seen some looks before that I could tell were not complimentary and were angry at times. There you go preaching about gambling and you know that I like to gamble. There you go preaching about social drinking and you know I have an issue with that. There you go preaching about this, the one church again, and you know that I think we ought to be more broad-minded than that. So many things that I could mention here to you. What is Jeremiah told? You don't be afraid of their facial expressions, no. I'm with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord, even if they give you dirty looks and death stares. You just keep on peeling out the watchword. Silence it never, Jeremiah. Look at J Jeremiah 1, 17. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them, how much? All that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. He says, don't you be wrapped up with fear at what they're saying to you. Look at Jeremiah chapter 11. In Jeremiah 11, this is very fascinating. In verse 19, Jeremiah, how's it going for you? How would you define your ministry? Look at verse 19. I was like a lamb or an ox brought to the slaughter. 
I knew not. They devised devices against me, saying, let's destroy the tree with the fruit and let's cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. And so look at what the problem is in verse 21. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of the men of Anathoth, that seek thy life, saying, prophesy not in the name of the Lord, that you die not by our hand. Jeremiah, if you keep preaching what you're preaching, we're going to kill you. I have been given dirty looks before, but I've never been physically threatened in Jeremiah chapter 20, Jeremiah got smacked for what he taught. Look at Jeremiah 20, Pasher, who was the son of Emmer the priest. You'd think he would certainly have known better, been taught better. He heard what Jeremiah was prophesying. And so in verse 2 of Jeremiah 20, then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet, put him in the stocks in the high gate of Benjamin. By the word, the word smote there, he beat him is the literal meaning of the word. I've never been beaten for something that I preached from God's word. Jeremiah knew what that was like. And the stocks were not there for your creature comfort. They would distort the body and the limbs into all kinds of contortions the body was never intended to go. And Jeremiah, you can understand why he would uh, start thinking, maybe I'll go into the motel business and just come up with a place where people can stop and stay. But here in Jeremiah chapter 20, you'll notice in verse four, thus saith the Lord, uh, look at what Jeremiah says to this pasture in verse three. He does not take this beating. The beating is designed to shut Jeremiah up. You hush, we don't want, we want to silence you forever. The song we just sang said silence it never. You peel out God's word, the watch word, and you silence it never. You'd never back down from it. Pastor says, if you don't quit preaching it, I'm going to do worse to you next time than just beat you. So what's Jeremiah's response in verse 3 when he brought him out of the stocks? It's like, well, have you learned your lesson? And Jeremiah says in verse 3, the Lord has not called thy name, Pastor. Uh, from now on, we're going to call you Megor Misabab. What's that mean? For thus saith the Lord, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends. They're going to fall by the sword of their enemies. Your eyes are going to behold it. I'll give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. He's going to carry them captive into Babylon and slay, slay them with a sword. Hey, Pasher, your name's not Pasher anymore. God's changed your name to capital T Terror. Because that's what you're going to bring to yourself and to others around you. Jeremiah is not backing down. Peel out the watchword, Jeremiah. Silence it never. But Jeremiah's human. And I want you to notice what he starts feeling in verse number 7. After he puts Pasher in his place and says, you're going to Babylon. You're going to die there. You and your family and friends. Yep. The ones you prophesied lies to, you're going to die with those people in Babylon. Verse 7 is now Jeremiah talking to God. He's pouring his heart out to God. He feels deceived. Lord, you told me you'd protect me and no one would be able to, to prevail over me and hurt. Lord, I was deceived. You're... You're stronger than I, you've prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone is mocking me. Since I spake, I cried out. I was the peeler. I peeled out the watchword, yes. I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. And so then I said, Jeremiah, what'd you say? I'm gonna silence myself. I will not make mention of him, verse 9, nor speak any more in his name. So Jeremiah, how'd that work for you? Peel out the watchword, silence it never. He said, his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. 
I was weary with forbearing, and I could not hold it in. I couldn't stay. I had to preach. I had to peel out the watchword. I had to tell what God's battle cry was. I had to speak forth the word of God. Jeremiah 26, he's standing outside the gate, standing at the gate to the temple there at the Lord's house in Jeremiah 26. And God told him to go there and to speak all the words, not to diminish any word. And you know, it's possible to be a preacher and to not preach absolute error, but not preach the truth that's needed. Jeremiah is told, God tells him, I want you to speak all the words I command you, diminish not a word. And you tell them, verse 4, if you'll hearken to me to walk in my law, which I've set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but, but you've not hearkened. If you don't listen, I'm going to make you like Shiloh. By the way, Shiloh's where the tabernacle once was. And yet it was destroyed. This idea that, oh, if we've got the tabernacle of the temple, we... We cannot be destroyed. God says, you're not very a good student of history because the tabernacle used to be at Shiloh and I destroyed Shiloh. So what makes you think just because you've got the temple that you're good? No, watch verse six. I will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Now, when Jeremiah verse eight made an end of speaking, all the Lord told him to tell the people, the priests, the prophets, and all the people took Jeremiah and look at the last phrase in verse eight. Thou shalt surely die. You're going to die, sir. First time we tried to shut you up, you just kept on preaching. Well, but let's see how you do this time. Why have you prophesied, verse 9, in the name of the Lord, saying, This house will be like Shiloh. This city will be desolate without an inhabitant. They viewed Jeremiah as a traitor. You're on Babylon's side. No, God is the one telling me to tell you that you're going into Babylonian captivity. I'm only telling you what God said. Look at verse 12. Then spake Jeremiah to the people, the princes. He said, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house, against this city, all the words that you've heard. Now, therefore, amend your ways and your doings. Obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will repent him of the evil that is pronounced against you. As for me, I'm in your hand. If you want to kill me, kill me. But I'm not backing down. I'm going to peel out the watchword, silence it never. You know for certain if you do kill me, you're going to be putting innocent blood on your hands. Two chapters later, in Jeremiah 28, You've got Hananiah who says, hey, good news, everyone, good news. You know the people that have already been taken into captivity? Good news, they're going to be back home, and within two full years, they'll all be back. Jeremiah had preached back in chapter 25 that, no, this is going to be a 70-year captivity, 70 years. Well, who do you think would be the most popular preacher among the people? The guy telling them within two years, everybody will be back home? Or the one, Jeremiah, who's actually preaching what God said? It's going to be the full 70. Everyone loved Hananiah. Oh, I, I told someone I was going to write a sermon called Hananiah preached a good sermon today. He's my favorite preacher. He told them what they wanted to hear. Jeremiah told them what God actually said. Jeremiah said, I'd be thrilled if everyone came home within two full years. But he then makes it clear that that was a false prophecy. And Hananiah then does something dramatic in verse 10. He takes this yoke of bondage that Jeremiah had been wearing as a visual aid to signify the bondage God's people were going into into Babylonian captivity. Hananiah takes that yoke off of Jeremiah's neck. And can you picture this? He breaks it triumphantly in front of the crowd as if to say, that's what's going to happen to your bondage. It'll be broken. They're all coming home. Hananiah, Hananiah, yes. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in verse 12. After Hananiah had broken the yoke off his neck. You go tell Hananiah, verse 13, thus saith the Lord, you've broken a yoke of wood, 
yokes of wood, but you will make for them yokes of iron. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and they shall serve him and I've given him the beast of the field also. And then Jeremiah says, Hananiah, hear this. The Lord has not sent you. You're making this people trust in a lie. And therefore, God says he's going to cast you off the face of the earth. You're going to die this year. Because you've taught rebellion against the Lord. Well, what, uh, what's the date at the beginning of chapter 28? Fourth year, fifth month. What's the date at the end of chapter 28? Same year, seventh month. Hananiah dies in the seventh month of that same year. So the false prophet that everyone loved died as a false prophet. One more example here from the prophets in Amos chapter seven. Look at Amos. Talk about trying to silence a preacher. Here we see one of the narratives in Amos that's rare to see. He's basically writing about his sermons and visions, but here's something that actually happens in verse 10 that's a narrative to the story. Amaziah, a priest of Bethel, sends to Jeroboam, the king of Israel. He says, um, Amos is conspiring against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. We are sick and tired of his preaching. That's essentially what he's saying. For thus Amos said, Amos says Jeroboam's going to die by the sword and Israel will surely be led away captive out of their own land. Now, remember the English Bible we have is not chronologically arranged. Amos would have preached all this prior to the events of Jeremiah. But you'll see here that Amos is telling the northern kingdom of Israel, you're going to be led into captivity too, Assyrian captivity. Well, Amaziah tells Amos in verse 12, O thou seer, go, flee into the land of Judah, and there make your living, or eat your bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again anymore at Bethel. It's the king's chapel. It's the king's court. You're going to be put to silence, is his point. Silence this man. No, Amos will peel out the watchword and silence it never. He says... The Lord took me, verse 15, as I followed the flock, and the Lord told me to go prophesy to Israel. Now, therefore, hear thou the word of the Lord. You say prophesy not against Israel, drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife is going to be a harlot in the city. Your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword. Your land is going to be lived on by someone else. They're going to be dividing up your property for themselves. And you're going to die in a polluted land. And Israel, mark it down, is surely going to go into captivity. And 30 years later, approximately, they did. Now, Ezekiel is a great prophet to look at as it relates to our theme for this week, milk and meat, nutrition, because I want you to see what Ezekiel does as a prophet of God. Ezekiel chapter 2, he says, son of man, stand on your feet, stand upon thy feet. And he said, I'll speak to you. And then Ezekiel says, the spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet, and I heard him that spoke. And now watch the words. See if these sound very familiar. Again, chronologically, Jeremiah came first. Ezekiel, 597 B.C., goes into captivity with some of the other men of Judah, into the Babylonian captivity. And uh, notice what God is telling him in Ezekiel 2 and verse 3. Son of man, I'm sending you to the children of Israel to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even to this very day. They are impudent children. Literally, they are hard-headed. They are hard-headed, yes, stiff-hearted. I'm sending you unto them, and you say, thus saith the Lord God. You give them the word. 
And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, at least they'll know there's been a prophet among them. And see if verse 6 sounds familiar. And thou, son of man, don't be afraid of them. Neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. Or they're going to try to prick at you with their words, and you're going to feel like you're dwelling among scorpions. Don't be afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks. You speak my words unto them, silence it never, whether they will hear, whether they will forbear. You just preach. Son of man, you hear what I say. Don't be rebellious and fail to say what I say. Open your mouth, eat what I give you. Now this is where we get into the milk and nutrition part of the theme. What's Ezekiel told here? You eat what I give you, all right? God, what you, what's on the menu? Watch verse 9. I looked, behold, a hand was sent to me, and a roll of a book was therein. He spread it before me, and it was written within and without on front and back, in other words. And there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. And remember the book, chapter, and verse divisions we have were not original, so this thought continues into chapter 3. Moreover, he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this roll. And go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he caused me to eat that scroll. He said, son of man, cause your belly to eat it. Go ahead and fill up on it. He said, I ate it. It was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Now, son of man, you go. You get to the house of Israel. You speak with my words unto them. You're not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language. You're not foreigners. You're sent to the house of Israel. Not to many people of a strange speech and a hard language whose words you can't understand. Sadly, if I'd sent you to them, they would have listened to you. My own people won't. Verse 7, the house of Israel will not hearken to thee. They will not hearken to me. All the house of Israel, they're impudent and hard-hearted. Behold, I've made your face strong against their faces, your forehead strong against their foreheads. Have you ever seen someone deliberately headbutt someone else? And you think, oh, how does the person receiving that or giving that stand that? These people are so hard-headed. God tells Jeremiah, they're like an adamant, harder than flint have I made your forehead. You're going to be harder than they. You're, you're going to be like the stone that breaks the hardest stone. And I'm going to make you... To where you won't be afraid. Look at the last phrase in verse 9. Neither be dismayed at their looks. Though they be a rebellious house. Son of man. All my words that I speak unto thee. Receive in thine heart. Hear with thine ears. And then go. You peel out those words. You get them to them of the captivity. To the children of the people. You speak to them and tell them. Thus saith the Lord God. And whether they will hear. Or whether they will forbear. Drop down to verse 17. Son of man, I've made you a watchman. So what is this? Peel out the watchword. You are a watchman. You have an alarm, a cry to send forth. I want you to sound out the alarm and silence it never. No, don't, don't back down from this. You hear the word of my mouth and look at verse 17. Give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you'll surely die and you don't warn him. And you don't speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. Well, that same wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. You didn't even try to warn him. Yet if you warn the wicked and he doesn't turn from his wickedness nor his wicked way, he dies in his iniquity, but at least you've delivered your soul. You did all you could. And you know, we've got too many preachers in too many places in our modern time who are looking the other way on certain issues and they won't say what God has clearly said about the matter because they're afraid. And we cannot silence ourselves when it comes to the word of God. We have to warn the man who's righteous never to leave that righteousness, to warning him that if he does, he'll die in his sins. If you'll go with me to the New Testament, 
This reminds me of John the Baptizer. In Matthew chapter 3, we see John the Baptizer, who is definitely willing to peel out the watchword, and he's not going to be silenced. He saw many of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, come to his baptism. He said to them, O generation of vipers, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat, or suitable for repentance. And don't think within yourself, well, we have Abraham for our father. We're descendants of Abraham. We've got our ticket punts. No, he says, that's not what God needs right now. God is able to make these stones into Abraham's seed if he wants to. No, he warns them about being baptized with fire by Jesus' baptism in fire, not baptism of fire at holy. Acts 2, the Holy Spirit baptism. No, this is the fiery baptism of eternal torment. Go with me to Luke chapter 3 as we start closing out. I want to give the invitation here in a moment, but uh, I, I, I want to notice something here with you. Luke chapter 3, and look at verse number 19. This is a statement that, I mean, I've always known that John the baptizer told Herod, it's not lawful for you to have the wife you have. But I had not paid enough attention to this verse. Verse 19, but Herod the Tetrarch being reproved by him, yes, for Herodias his brother's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done. It wasn't just that situation where he had a wife that's not lawfully his. He was evil in so many ways, and John the baptizer will not be silenced. He's peeling out the watchword to this Herod. And you know, this Herod, the same Herod uh, family, threatens Jesus our Lord. Look at Luke chapter 13 and verse number 31. Luke chapter 13 and verse 31. The same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. We don't want to hear you. We don't want to see you. Get out of you want to be you want Herod to kill you? You better get out of here. And Jesus says, You go tell that fox. Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I'll be perfected. I've, I'm on my own schedule. Then he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, verse 34, which killest the prophets, stonest them that are sent to thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen does gather her brood under her wings, but you would not. Jesus tells them point blank that their house is going to be left to them desolate. Their temple, yes, it's going to be left desolate. As we close out, I want to go to the book of Acts and notice some Christians. Before the name was officially given, these were followers of Christ. But nevertheless, they do set an example for us as we close about peeling out the watchword and silencing it never. In Acts 4, the authorities could not stand the fact that they were preaching the resurrection of Christ and they arrested them and told them point blank in verse number 17 not to preach that anymore. In fact, they said, let's straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name, this name of Christ. So they called them. They say, don't peel out the watchword. Silence yourselves. We don't want to hear this message you've been preaching. They commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said, whether it's right in the sight of God to hearken to you more than unto God, you be the judge. We cannot but speak the things we've seen and heard. So when they would further threatened them, they let them go. Next thing you know, in chapter five, they're released from prison. And they're speaking in the temple to all the people the words of this life, verse 20. And oh, verse 28, they are called before the authorities and they say, didn't we straightly command you, you should not teach in this name? You be silent, you hush about this. You fill Jerusalem with your doctrine, intend to bring this man's blood upon us. 
Peter said, we ought to obey God. The other apostles also answered, we ought to obey God rather than men. And they called the apostles and they beat them in verse 40, thinking that'll put a stop to this. And they left the presence of the council, verse 41, rejoicing. And then verse 42, are they going to continue to peel out the watchword or will they be silenced? Daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not trying to be gloom and doom here, but let's face it. Would you agree there's more of an antagonism towards Christianity right now than there has been in a long, long time in this country? And so it's entirely conceivable that things we've preached and gotten by with preaching without any authorities coming to arrest us, if certain people get in positions of power or retain positions of power, I can promise you this, there's going to be more and more of an effort to try to put a muzzle on Christianity. There are going to be more people telling us we can't say what the truth is about marriage and divorce and remarriage and gender uh, teaching from God's word. And we, we're not going to be allowed to say the things that the Bible clearly says about homosexuality without threat of jail, imprisonment, those things may be coming our way sooner than we can imagine if certain things don't start breaking in a different direction. But let me just ask this question, and I'm starting behind me and coming forward. If we get to the point where physical punishment is going to be in the equation for teaching what God's word teaches, are you willing to do it? We still teach what God's word says, even if it means dungeon, arrest, prison, beatings, threats, executions. That song, true hearted, whole hearted, faithful and loyal. Valiant soldiers who are battling, we are going to peel out the watchword and silence it never. We've got to stand up for what's right and try to convert as many people as we can to the Christian cause, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. I do not recall whether there was an invitation song selected or not for this hour. I started acting like there was going to be and then remember what, what if they don't have one planned? I'm just going to offer you the opportunity to come if you need to in any way, shape, or form, either to become a child of God by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized for the remission of sins, as the book of Acts so clearly teaches, as Brother Colley showed us so well, or to uh, come down one of these aisles if you need to publicly repent for sins committed, we'd invite you to take opportunity to do that now without delay. This is your chance.